All right. Alex, hello. Hello. Well, welcome back to Simulation. Uh huh. The fourth time we're sitting down together yeah, on the show. Yeah. And let's hear the update. So, how have you been? How's Cambridge been? How's the Bay Area been this okay. visit? Okay. Yeah, I haven't been in the Bay Area since like last um, last September. So it's like it's like a refreshing of say um, hmm of so let's see here. Even though uh, so it's like a refresh of like all the places that I missed out on so that on last time that I can get I can get today, especially since a lot of things have updated since then. Um, I have a better, a lot of communities also changed so quickly over time. Um, yeah, I visited, so I originally came back to the Bay Area because I was, um, I was basically um, egged on by, uh, leered by a certain, uh, bay, um, by an anti, an Asian American Aid Association, Asian Association thing by Jun Yan. Jun Yan basically hosted an event, an Asian Association event, which was co-hosted with AAS, so I, I ended up going there. I ended up limiting Cosmo Meal Key to come there too, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I, it was like it was like a gathering of like all the top all the top important Asian researchers from the U.S., which is important, especially because I know with this such thing about aging is that once you're interested in it, you cannot be uninterested in it because it affects <laughs> everything. Like yeah. it affects the rest of your entire life, and most of, most people stay most of their lives in an aged state rather than in the most optimal useful state that they exist. Uh, but anyways, back to the point. Uh, me and some of my friends, we got updates on say what are the uh, what are the hot areas and new people are looking into. Um, also, chromosome dynamics, um, and even though like. I generally, I generally prefer online forms of interaction. The fact of the matter, that matter is that a lot of a lot of people still do real life modes of interaction where you where your fastest learning rates are just local uh, are just local, and also you, you you see which people are like like extra enthusiastic and, and getting to know you um, with repeated exposure to some people over time. You just know which people give you more are more willing to give you information that you can learn faster than reading a dead paper dead paper paper book. So yeah, um, so yeah, stuff, stuff that. Also I was it was amazing to see um, be a be in a reunion of like Buck Institute and Cape Berlin Lab people and it's those people who I appreciate them the most, especially because I've had interaction with Matt Cape Berlin's lab for quite some time. And also I've interacted with the Buck Institute people too. Um, yeah. You, you're reminding me how it's similar for when I go to Cambridge. It's like me also visiting the powerful clusters of people that, uh -huh. I didn't, that I'm getting either an update from yeah, or that I yeah. haven't hung out with yeah, yet or interviewed yeah, yet. Yeah. So you're kind of doing that for the Bay Area when you yeah. come and visit here. Yeah, also I finally met um, this one person, Braden McLean, who came, f came from, uh, who works for Cruz now. He's like an integrator of a lot of influences I've been exposed to. Like he lived with Masonic House, with the Teal Fellows, the 32 member group house. house um, and he also was involved in the with the rationality slash EA community, so he knows the people there. He um, and because he works on the machine learning algorithms based in, he also knows Jeremy Nixon and that South Bay crew. So he's he's the one who basically like knows information flows that uh, he he's in, exposed to a set of integrated information flows, and most people from the North uh, North Bay or South Bay aren't real, exactly exposed to. Like he was one of the early less strong readers. Most um, people most people who work on AI problems, they. Um, they're not that interested in most, uh, in say, big picture uh, AI uh, self improvement stuff that rationalists are into. And people oftentimes hate the rationalists for it, but I still think the rationalists have a lot of merit. Like even Jeremy Nixon, he says, and Will Wheaton, they, they both say, I don't get why so, people, so many people hate the rationalist group because they, they, still, they still have a lot going on, even though they, they also have like, a, a lot of flaws that prevents them from basically being the best, being the perfect people who can save the world, who who have the most power to save the world, even though they used to think that that they used to they used to put dream about saving the world. Um, so yeah, so Brandon McLean, he's also like kind of knows how um, he uh, he was also one of the early founders of the Event Horizon House, which um, was like a legendary house with uh, with much loads all of Habrica and. Um, Basically, oh, and early sea far retreat pe people too. So it's like so many important communities, and and these communities are just like so open about themselves, and they have so many smart and thoughtful people that you just have to get to know know what they are. 
For those that don't yet know, Alex, which communities would you say you are most involved with? It is the, the air quality sensor, yeah. <laughs> that thing is so important for health and longevity. I agree with you, totally. Um, so which ones, which ones would you say? You say? Aging is one of your hot ones. Would you say now um, effective altruism is another big one, EA? I'm just, I'm just there. I'm not, I don't really self, I don't, I'm like, I'm like, I just somehow was, somehow magically integrated into the information flows of, of the EA community super well. And since I've been there for a while, I, I just, I'm just like a source and think of information that, that not very many other people ha are in it, even though like, I, I want to brand, I, I want to be in other communities it's just um yeah you just learn so much about human nature and human psychology by being in the interview community because they're, they're yeah. just willing to talk about anything and everything and they have like a shared collective history that you uh, and a group group a group story a group theology that starts in early less wrong days and um yeah just one of the best captured um the one of the social groups that, that that best have a sense of sense of self a sense of how it was how it evolved like um with, in respect with call uh, with college um say college culture a lot of times seems to recycle after four years and people tend to be completely ignorant of what of what the past was like even though like i know some people from caltech who seem to have kept plot of their school's dr social drama over spirits over periods that might have lasted like more than eight years, but not much more than that. And for those that weren't at Junyun's uh, event and also the aging conference that you were at in San Jose, what is happening at the cutting edge of aging right now? Um, a lot of things. And I, I would not necessarily say that the material discussed there is at the cutting edge. It's very, it's presented in a way as to be understandable to most of the aging community. So, um, so I did get to see like, uh, so basically like mainstream aging research, which is still like folk, more focused on characteristic of like chromosome dynamics. Um, the chromosome dynamics part, uh, also like epigenetic and genetic measuring, uh, the part by Morgan Levine about measuring epigenetic and genetic aging. Um, it's just new measures, that me new measures that basically measuring how an organism age. That's like, that's like recent state of the art, but it's also not like, not exactly G George Church cutting edge level um, of research, as in the, t the, 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 uh, the, the, the synthetic biology stuff that, that changes everything. Um, it's not exactly that, that but it's still good, good enough for me to like follow and not get lost. Like if you show most synthetic biology or gene editing research, which is that, the gene editing, that's the cutting edge, but they don't necessarily know aging. They're the more, more month development, yeah, but yeah. And is it that the unraveling of, of telomeres is the most important part of chromosomal dynamics? No. No, what that's, part is? Uh, that's just the easiest for most people to understand and to, to internalize. There are so many others, like, um, for example, the how lamin A uh, is a, it's important for, let's say, chromo for uh, for making sure that pro the chromosomes are translated properly, or like, or or, or for position of the chromosomes and which part which parts are like tethered to the, it, it, they're a way of, of of tethering the chromosomes so they don't become too loose. And um, oftentimes the mm -hmm. process of aging is one where where say the chromosomes are loosened up and and and, and you lose information about uh, the uh, the the precise stoichiometry stoichiometric ratio at which persons uh, should be translated at which time. Also, one, one big issue of aging is that oftentimes there is something known as um, ER stress and Golgi stress, or also just a lot of, time, a lot of times um, when you have proteins, uh, pro, uh, protein unfolding stress, uh, in which case, um, um, like you, you just have proteins that get translated at, at the inappropriate times so and they don't get the localization signal factor. And anyways, um, the point is, um, um, when proteins are trans, 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 so the cell can sometimes sense when uh, sense stress when proteins aren't translated, translated in at the same proportions, which then like it gives the ER a, a stress response. But yeah. Um, anyway, some other points were um, people w uh, went deeper down into say um, standard metabol metabolic pathways like a tryptophan degradation or. Flavin, uh, flavin, adenine, uh, flat, flavin, uh, flavin, 
adenosine mononucleases and um, how, how changing expression of these affects longevity. Also, more ways of measuring. Um, there's, there, um, let's say, another one was a method development person who uh, basically did did use ways of like trying to partition out, partition out yeast um, and um, yeast microfluidics, fluid, like new, new microfluidics uh, fluid devices too, to basically um, capture, uh, automatically capture, uh, capture a cell, um, uh, separate out cells um, based on properties. Like I know in the Caberlin lab, there, you usually have a lot of people who just who did, who did a lot of automated yeast. Uh, they, they, it wasn't even automated, just count, count them of yeast cells, which he sent a lot of undergrads to do, and it wasn't exactly the best use of labor, but now that now that there's been, been more automated, it's also like uh, Adam and C. Elegance analysis away. There's a, there, so there are people uh, in conjunction with like the Longevity Research Institute, which they're constantly starting, which um, which is basically trying to figure out ways of automating uh, testing of all these uh, new drugs and me- metabolites on um, C. elegans or um, that. Also, people are trying to find, a, uh, find new model organisms, which hopefully uh, get. Uh, and basically, like a, a sort of mechanistic understanding of, of this. It's still not modification. Um, modification, like uh, enhanced methods of delivery, delivering these new cells, is as more synthetic biology or George Church stuff rather than traditional aging research. That wasn't really covered in, in as much depth. It's obvious that you're so deep in, in the field. Would you, would you say that one of the easiest ways to explain what is aiming to be done is to retain? the youthful homeostatic capacity for our rest of our lives? Um, yeah, the youthful homeostasis, uh, for example, the, the ability of a cell to respond to stressors, this is one of the things that goes uh, goes most R with age. Like, for example, glutathione is depleted so quickly with age. It's also glu- do, depleted so quickly with exposure to, c- to cigarette smoke or even e-cigarettes. And this is like one of the reasons why people get hung, hang, alcohol hangover so quickly even after the 20s, that's when a lot of things decline. But um, mm-hmm. for example, recover, ability to recover from all nighters or, 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 or stress like this, um, basically this, this, this is often template declines first. Yeah, yeah, okay. And then I wanna also um, help people um, get on a, on, a, on a super connector level. So that's some aging stuff. Yeah, Let's yeah. talk on a super connector level now. Um, so I'm curious, whenever I, come to you know when at last time I came to Cambridge uh, in May it was very evident that you were going through and making tons and tons of connections to people that um, that we should interview and and it also hit me that Cambridge is another really dense cluster of people that are building the future and in many ways it's science driven uh, rather than in the in Silicon Valley in many ways it's like entrepreneurship driven so it's kind of uh, some differences there everything yeah. here is a startup versus there it's yeah. more science re- research um, so it sparked in me the desire to want to make a second recording studio in Cambridge as soon as possible, hopefully in 2020, um, and just be able to sit down with more and more people out there more frequently. And I'm curious, how does how does one end up figuring out this balance? It seems as though you are really heavy on this edge tennis information patch jumping, so you spend most of your time T- talking to other people about the edge of the field that they're researching and you jump from conversation to conversation uh, and from edge of field to edge of field whereas for example like with me I have to spend a pretty decent amount of my time on not talking to people I have to like actually get into focus mode and so do you find yourself getting into focus mode as well as the edge tennis that you're playing um, not yet at the moment, though I could go to focus mode at any time. Um, obviously I could like be reading biochemistry comes to papers all the fucking time, like the author of fightagent.org is, or like, um, Ben Best or like some of those other people who are like real into aging. Um, yeah, I just find that for the reason I maximize the amount of information I learn per student second if I don't focus and somehow the fact is that I seem to be doing something that no one else is doing, which produces value in itself. Um, so, this is, so this is as though the amount of 
cutting edge knowledge per second that you can achieve is greatest when you talk to other people at the edge of their fields about yeah. what they're researching yeah. and working yeah. on rather yeah. than reading biochemistry books or papers or watching videos, that type of, yeah. yeah That's okay. one way of doing it. Um, I used, I started off by reading, reading books and papers, which I still think is the fastest way to, as Jeremy knows, um, it's a fa the fastest way to learn, really contribute is to learn textbooks. So really it's like reading textbooks while in the center of where of where all activity is happening so long as you have perfect intentional control, which no which very few people people have. Um, in fact, earlier today, during that event, um, people were we, we, uh, Vassar, Jeremy, and I were talking about um, basically like which people seem to be completely in control of themselves, and they couldn't name very many people other than let's, let's say Jeff Bezos or. Demis Hassabis, they, they were also asking which people seem to be the smart, uh, the smart people, people they know and who were in completely in control of, of what the intake and outtake and, um, and like not bound to weird, um, weird rules. And then the only people they could name were people like Jeff Bezos or um, Demis Hassabis, basically completely, completely free. Whereas other, other, other times, like even if you're a CEO, you're still held back by other people and what they expect of you in, in all those meetings, um, which apparently is what happens to a lot of Fortune 500 companies. And people just don't have the same agency that they used to, even though it appears they're super high status -y, they're the leader of the company, um, but they still don't exactly have the type of control Jeff Bezos has. So as though that having complete governance over one's own input stream is yeah. top priority in yeah, life. Yeah, I even asked them if, they, if, they, if, if Ray Dalio was one of them, and they said um, Ray Dalio doesn't exactly have, have optimal executive function, even though he outsources a lot of his stuff away in, in an amazing way. He might do it in a way to compensate for, let's say, not being, not being in full control of himself. They were even mentioning stuff about Peter Thiel versus um, whether about Peter Thiel and versus Gary Kasparov, and like, is Peter Thiel really in, in, in as much control over, over scenes as we like to think he is? Because he has an entire network that forms around him, but uh, um, it's still like, even if you're like a venture, capital, venture capitalist and you throw money at people, it's still like you, you don't have complete ability to, 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 to control command people. They, you, you still have to trust them on words, and especially when they don't have the entire, all the time in the world to do due, due diligence. So I think, it would, as I think due diligence would, um, I think there might be a, be a VC who does a, a perfect way of doing due diligence where they do due, due, due diligence on the hyper open people and hyper open people, who, people willing to be hyper open who might not get other opportunities, might sometime in the future get, um, get vetted by say a due diligence VC and get an advantage based on that. Simply because they would, uh, they would, ha they would allow themselves the possibility of, of say, um, oh, of say, uh, because it's there, there's a form of trust that that happens when you allow yourself to be say more uh, to be um, to be tracked a little bit more than other people are willing to be tracked. Okay, so it seems as though there's different colors on the color wheel of people's uh, behavior patterns in our world. So some people are just on the playground, playground Earth, just playing. Other people are on the playground, but they want to solve problems and make the the civilization prosper over time more effectively. Yeah, yeah. And then there's also um, people that within that subgroup of wanting to make the world better spend <laughs> spend most of their time on what you do versus what let's say someone else does which is you can you can bounce from conversation to conversation and help push conversations um, out at the edge of, of of knowledge while other people are maybe doing things like some of the uh, people that work at startups or companies that are actually kind of building things in the in that are building physical things in the 3d world that then uh, yeah, 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 and I think um, the problem is that it, they can't search for each other very well. Um, right now, as um, as the uh, most um, as like the internet, there's a certain there's a certain type of there's a certain group of people who are on the edge of the internet. And that's a group of like Devin Zugo or Patrick Hulizen or Tyler Cowen or Topus House people, where they're like tw or, or like Sam Altman, where they're like generated into a tweet stream of the of the edge um and it's sadly it does not contain very many people from Quora which is like 
a huge, which is a huge difference because you'd expect that the, that they did Algen Core, except almost none of them, none of the people who are kind of edge of the Twitter sphere are like people who used to be big on Cora. But anyways, the point is, um, yeah, it's like you need to figure out how to make it. You need to like really figure out, out how to um, make them. Um, Basically, make one of them explain the value of the other person more, more, more to others. Like even even if if it results in say more crowdfunding or more of a way to like this. this so I know that the internet ed, that this edge is talking about patronage systems like Alexei Guzov and um, and and Patrick Collison and that group of people. They're all all talking about basically trying to build pay, better patronage systems, especially because nowadays there's more money available than ever, in a sense, and most cheap, most um, uh, most non-rent-seeking um, occupation um, uh, uh, products are much cheaper than they used to be, even even if the even if say the occupational licensing slash rent seeking uh, seeking scenes are, are driving prices up. Um, but the thing is, like, it's so much, it's so easy to get new computers or external hard drives than ever before, or to, or to like start creating scenes, um, because like the the, st the stuff and also programming, it's also just easier to program than use than ever it was before. And Let, let's hit a couple. Yeah. Let's hit a couple things here. Um, one of the things is that to be in full control of one's own input stream. Yeah. So this is a, uh, and also being able to decide if you want to build in the 3D world, if you want to just play oh, with yes. different people yeah. at the edge yeah. of their fields. So to be in full control of that, to know how to designate uh, parts of what you have to do to other people in order for your time to free up, and also to the whole embedded growth obligation that these organizations have. We embedded have to growth, yeah. Yeah, that we have to figure out because it seems as though at times the cor the corporation may not, we may not want that co corporation to con to continue on their embedded growth trajectory, and that it may actually just be better for that company to. Uh, to take a to take a, a hiatus potentially, or even to just uh, break off into separate sub subsections of an organization, or to just stop functionality completely. But the whole th thought that that the shareholders have to continue earning dividends over time, the company has to stay, even though it may actually be harming the social fabric rather than benefiting it. Um, okay, so that's a bit on the on the nodes and and uh, edge tennis and input streams. And to be in full control of one's input stream is so critical. I really enjoyed that point. Um, now, and not falling for opportunity obesity either. We're so overly saturated with opportunities that we take them without realizing that we can potentially have greater control over hanging out with certain people or reading certain things or oh, doing yeah. certain things ourselves oh, that yeah. can rocket our, our, ourselves yeah, up. Sometimes faster. knowing cutting people off is like something that many of the most effective people are known to doing. Um, but kind of, but, but, but also cutting people off in ways that doesn't seem rude or. How do um, you do that? How for example, that? think about Demis Hathibus. He has to cut a lot of people off because whenever he goes, people people surround him. Peter Thiel, he also has to cut himself off. Why? I've seen some Peter Thiel talks where at the end of the session, everyone fucking crowds around him. Um, just think anyone, even the Dalai Lama or like or like famous kind people. Once you reach a certain level of fame, you just have to cut people off because everyone surrounds, surrounds you. So then you just have to develop an intimate stream where say you, you give people second chances because I think the mark of kindness is literally giving people second chances. Um, oftentimes, totally. uh, oftentimes the, yeah. first, the first question someone tries to approach, uh, approach you with is not exactly the, the most well-formed question. It may also, um, a lot of times, it may not be the, mo the question that People who are truth seeking will necessarily go after because people they just want a chance to to, to have bragging rights to, to talk to them or or be remember, remembered by that person even though oftentimes people 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 literally go up to famous people trying to try to be remembered remembered by them or um, just to have assurance that they, they're uh, even that even that someone else is not it's like can you say something profound enough in the five second window you have with a high power yeah, person yeah. that they want to pass more time with you and that's a very tough thing to yeah, be able to yeah. achieve but it's important to take your time on formulating exactly compressing a really powerful s couple sentences <laughs> into what someone would think is worthwhile for you to hang out with uh, yeah and afterward. also when people people talk in real life they don't remember their questions 
questions to answer. It's like people asking people ask ask someone else, well, what, do, what do you think of this? What do you think of that? In real life, and neither side remembers in the long run. That's why that's why I'm generally I generally have a very high preference in, in shifting most communication online, where it, it, where people actually will remember scenes. And then, what do you think about the movement, which it seems as though it's happening, where um, people are tapping into the social fabric, finding their other key, let's say. Uh, tennis player slash executors that they want to collaborate with and then they kind of unplug from the social fabric so that they don't have to get bing 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 that they, they can then focus on oh, the things yeah. that they want that's to do. That's what some people like Yuri Herrera do. Um, I know other people um, who they, they have to like Oftentimes they have to announce it publicly in a way so to, to demand enforcement and also to make sure that people don't get mad at them in case they do fall off um, for periods of time. It's like, but you have to maintain the discipline in order to do it. And it, oftentimes people who, who have the privilege to do, so people often have a privilege to do that when they are su sufficiently so socially or financially secure that they don't need to keep on reporting to someone else or their audience. Like yep, they, they have the confidence that they won't be forgotten um, or that their friends will, will actually come back to them or want to come back to them after taking these, like, say, six-month breaks or hiatuses. And sometimes it even conflicts with people's traditional nodes of friendships, which is why, like, some friends, all of a sudden, a friends fall apart because there's, um, there's asymmetry between how much each side wants to talk to each other, and sometimes um, people have to cut off old friends because of this. Yeah, the asymmetry with how often people want to talk, and also it's as though when your mind gets expanded to new ways of thinking, uh, it's really hard to go back to having uh, conversations that are of uh, old ways of thinking. So that's another one of the things is that we don't, I, I find, I'm finding myself more and more um, asking uh, people, what, what, what do you do when you have to cut off, Alex? Because because I, I, I have to um, focus more and more of my time um, al alone and not replying yeah, to people. Yeah. And so what do you, how do you uh, could disconnect from people, Alex, with politely? Um, I don't disconnect with people right now. I think that standard way to disconnect is announcing, announcing that you're planning to do it on, on your blog or social media. Um, it's probably best to do it on your blog. Uh, or some site where people just Google your name easily and just see, see that, you, that you're disconnecting. Though there's always a challenge in that if you are disconnecting, um, people may not, you may lose access to say opportunities or some information that might change your life. So then there's a more optimal the way to do scene. it. There's yeah. a more optimal way to do it potentially, which is that you say that, uh, announce on your socials and blogs that you are uh, that you're very, very selectively staying in touch with certain people right now as you are a build focused on in build mode. That way people can still reach out and you don't lose on those opportunities, but then you can select to reply or not to those people. Yeah, okay, that, that, that process seems to be more and more uh, important to figure out how to do. Um, Alex, let's, Let's um, let's end the, the conversation on this point, okay. um, which is um, you initially came up to me um, at uh, EAGX uh, in Boston and told me that certain people, and this is this is actually really good feedback. You told me that certain people won't take interviews with me because I'm not smart enough. And I was like, this is great because I need to hear feedback like this. It's it's very. Uh, it's very rare that people are as eccentric as you that they're able to just be like, hey Alan, did you know that some people won't take interviews with you because you're not smart enough? And I found that to be excellent because this is important feedback. And so if we can have more people that behave in this like super transparent, honest and uh, way that I think it'll help people grow. So will you deliver the feedback from that you gave me then and also that you're giving that you gave me even before we started streaming here where you were telling me that that, um, that sometimes the things that, that I say can sound a little bit like jargony and that um, how I can help Not be a jargony, better- Not jargony, more buzzwordy. Buzzwordy. How can I be a better interviewer in general, please? Okay, yes. um, so this is, let's see here. Um, one scene is, um, 
Let me think. First of all, I haven't watched many of the interviews because I'm like, I prefer text whenever possible. And that's something that's coming, guys. Uh, it, it's coming soon that we're going to have transcriptions for every single episode and knowledge graphs for every episode. Good. Yeah, knowledge so graphs, who's, who's going to do the knowledge graphs? We're going to work on that. That's awesome. gonna, it's going to come, yeah. Awesome, like with Peter Till. It's, it's very, yeah, uh, yeah, this is yeah. good. This is very good. And, and we know that those are key, really key points on our upcoming agenda. It's, uh, and a, as you all know that if we can get your help uh, through Patreon, PayPal, cryptocurrency donations, we can more easily get to that point together. So please do support us. All the links are in the bio in order to, to make that happen. And so that's totally on our agenda, those things. And I'm glad that you mentioned that because it's a frequent thing that we're starting to hear now from people is that I prefer transcriptions. I just want to parse, find the key points myself or also knowledge graphs will show you the key points. Um, highlight reels, five minute highlight reel of a one hour episode are also things that we're working on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so yeah, continue please on the feedback. Yeah, so they say that they say, they say you're a bit buzz, uh, um, buzzwordy. Who's or, they, oh, they say? Um, like um, w um, some people who I've talked to who, uh, who uh, like some, some, some people who are like very clear thinkers, um, like another thing is that maybe, maybe the space of things you say is a little bit constrained and not the most creative perhaps, which means that maybe you're, you, you're not, uh, you're not the most sophisticated or, crit or, or critical thinker, or you can, you can't imagine every single, you, um, totally. can't infinitely, you, your brain can't infinitely adapt to imagining every single, every single way, every single basically like every possible way of expressing a certain feeling or sentiment. Um, some people are just more verbally expressive than others and they, they, and they will eventually find a, a, way, a way to create, creative, creatively express a certain sentiment. Okay, let me, let me take a yeah. couple things here. One of the things is that- like verbal we, agility. We were, verbal agility, abstract thinking. Let's, let's take, a couple, yeah, let's take yeah. a couple things here. Um, one of the things is that um, the, the, the thought of, um, of being a generalist, which we talked about a little bit, as well as that, um, it, it, it becomes, when, you, when we're a generalist, it becomes harder to potentially play tennis across all of the different depths of the fields, but we can maybe help make good transfer connections of yeah, ideas, transfer learning. transfer learning connections across fields, which helps a lot. Yeah, people but, often use the but term. You're, but, people, it's, but the machine, like yeah. you said, it's, 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 it's so difficult to actually be able to, you're right, that the, the, cre the amount of creative uh, permutations that Oh, that one could run on how certain fields could relate to other fields yeah. and, and have, a, have me hit back a thought that's really profound and novel for the other person. Um, I'm not a machine that can do that quite yet in, in, the, in the greatest caliber. Maybe yeah. when I'm augmented further yeah. <laughs> that I can do that. Yeah, yeah coarse yeah. graining versus fine graining. Um, also, when people, when people use the word transfer, you learn it's also often used as a buzzword. Uh, interdisciplinary is also another buzzword. Um, just, Why are those like buzzwords rather than just words? They're so frequently used. They're so frequently used because they're they're a way of saying making people seem sophisticated or making seem, people seem like they're sophis a potentially sophisticated, or open-minded. And there's definitely a social tendency for people to virtue signal open-mindedness because open-mindedness is seen as like a, a, a huge virtue in this in an information-driven age and. Um, whenever it's seen as a virtue, people are inclined to signal that they have more of it than they actually do, even just for social acceptance, to be taken seriously, or the fact that being open-minded is necessary but not sufficient in order to do it. And in fact, I think some, a lot of virtue signaling happens around necessary but not sufficient scenes people have to do in order to actually be serious about something. Okay, and then let's say that uh, where where are the ways that an interviewer can stay open-minded? What are the key practices that they can do to stay open-minded, but then also not not come off buzzwordy? Uh, like yeah, I was asking or, you, should I should I give the question immediately after they finish, uh, or should I give a sentence or two and then uh, ask the question? So one thing is um, sometimes pre sometimes you get 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 people a list of questions they most want asked. Or answered sometimes, and that's um, usually what we do before the show yeah, when we yeah. sit down as we co-create the outline. Yeah. Of what also, I, yeah, um, yeah. sometimes um, one. So one reason why I generally have a strong preference for online formats is online formats are asynchronous, and you can, and um, like there's no time pressure. Um, so um, uh, sometimes, like the, the problem with real life in, in lectures is that once you ask a professor, sometimes they're under pressure to 
to provide an, an, a response, even if it's not a great response, or even if it's even if uh, even if it's not the possible response. But anyway, the point is, um, a lot of a lot of responses need need more time to think out before they actually respond. The, and um, video editing certainly doesn't make it easier. All the manual la labor involved in video editing, which is why we do the live streaming, yeah. which helps so yeah. much with yeah. that component. Um, and then, okay. And then, how about? Um, on a, a, what would you, what would be your ideal uh, pr interview process? Like for you and other people at the edge of the fields, like these people that say that Alan's not smart enough to interview me yet, right? That type of a person. What would um, Alan need to do in order, what would the skill be that I need to learn in order to be able to interview smarter people? Okay, um, I think it would be good to have someone comment on, someone to, who like, who watches all the lecture videos to just comment on your performance over time, like um, exposure. Um, was okay, you guys heard that. R give more comments about uh, about the perform my performance over time as an interviewer. And at, while you're at it, if you're doing that too, also comment about Ron's um, performance as well, doing the technical production um, and directing, because he's also starting to you know really do well with the compositions yeah, yeah. and embedding assets and that type. Also, of stuff, make so. pre predictions behind each interview about what you were really thinking about. What, what stressed you out the most, what were the most difficult decisions you had to make, and what you were struggling or straining to think about but didn't do before the interview. One great thing about video interviews is that they capture the moment just in time and they capture it in a way that makes it easy to access memories that came just before and after the interview. Yep. Um, it's like, it's like one, one of the best ways to do mind uploading is basically to just capture all the video of life logging, is to capture video of, of, of as much features as possible because the more features you capture, the more the easier it is for the brain to figure out which figure out exactly which um, which precepts are needed to access what you were actually thinking at the point of time, so that you, you can't go back and then improve in it. Like I know a lot of people who, who have video game players or sports players who were millions of people watch over them, and as long as you get the right feedback or you um, you are not overly distracted by haters' comments or um, non truth seeking comments or non helpful comments, then uh, then you will basically get like the best feedback ever. Although some of the feedback is from like people who are biasing from certain ways, people who like um, um, the most creative people don't don't heavily rely on other people in order to um, do it. So most most of the most creative people do things alone. Though I That's think That's what I'm saying. Yeah. That's yeah. why I got to spend a lot more time alone. I'm starting to realize that. Yeah. It helps a lot. Um, I, I, th I feel like what you're what you're saying about uh, having someone that can um, maybe be a little bit more uh, down the line also with some additional potentially um, funding is w there could be somebody that specifically focuses on just uh, the development I'm, I'm frequently reflecting on myself but uh, I, I think that if someone, I think even Jeremy went ahead and even hired someone to just personally yeah, yeah. Uh, like amplify his productivity by like following him around and saying mm -hmm. like, hey, you said that you were gonna do this thing, you're not doing this thing. Yeah. So that type of stuff's also quite interesting. Um, how about on an, on an, on an open-mindedness, Alex? Um, it seems as though that the, uh, the, the, most, the most generalists find themselves to be as open-minded as possible to be able to take in this mosaic of worldviews that ends up actually um, developing out into what I would say is the most truth, is when you can simultaneously abstractly reason eight billion people's perspectives, you have the most true worldview. And it's really difficult for a human brain to be able to do that, but can you literally see how someone from China sees a certain issue, how someone from the US, how someone from the Middle East sees yeah, a I think issue? Um, people need to, be, need to be capturing more of their input history and what input history led them to, to reach the conclusions that they read, reached. And I think people are often secretive about this because they are insecure about um, being falsified or they're just insecure about it for a variety of reasons. It's just not what some humans originally do and it makes people creeped out, which is kind of sad because it also inhibits us from reaching, say, um, sound or epistemic states. And then people all don't, all don't know what exactly led you to think this way. Yep, yep. And then Especially on, when so much of it is like privileged information, when somebody's hidden under, under behind NDAs. Yeah, yeah. So um, logging one's own input stream more effectively, I mean, our, like my input stream specifically is very evident with literally the people we feature on the show, this, these type of it's things. It's still not enough, very, of course. It's still not enough, totally, yeah. Um, even the... Uh, the amount of yeah other content that I that I that I consume correct books I read videos I watch all that type of stuff um, 
but then the output stream is also quite evident in terms of the things that I'm like the worry, the ways that the worldview is being augmented over time. Yeah. How evident that is with the the ways that I'm speaking about it. Um, okay, and then maybe uh, any last sort of bits of advice as an interviewer that I could embody. Um, probably ask for feedback from the other person about what they were expecting, what they w uh. It may, uh, maybe before, not in a way, before and after both before and after okay. preferably but not in a way that would exhaust them or, or cause them to behave yeah. sli slightly aversively this is the thing is that when people come in at first it's all about making them feel super comfortable yeah, that they're yeah. going to radiate from their heart as best as they can they're going to that they're they're going to rock it and then if i'm asking them hey like what are your expectations it's kind of like that that can maybe hinder some some yeah things it can also that. I don't yeah. like realize those questions either even though they're important it's just it's not what my mind's focused on right now um there's so, so there's still a lot of like polite a bias to, towards polite signaling like yeah, what yeah. you didn't expect very much and yeah and usually it helps when even when I just show them what notes yeah. that I've made for yeah. the show and that they're able to co-create and say that they want this or don't want that that type yeah, of stuff yeah. yeah that helps a lot um, and then. Um, <clears throat> yeah, this is this has been good. I think we covered a decent amount of things: uh, aging, uh, super connecting, uh, interviewing skills. Yeah, we talked a good amount of things. Any other last thoughts on the way out? Uh, yeah, I think there is a chance this is becoming a more self-aware show than most other shows. There's a chance, which if you got the right people, which I think. It's going to be important if we ever are to create a hive mind or like a hive mind that coordinates better because right now there is a giant global coordination problem and the global giant global coordination problem is why um, basically why the why um, shit is going to happen unless we solve it like it, whether it's climate change which is like one of the big coordination problems or certain other coordination problems. Yeah, the global giant coordination problem is uh, needing to be yeah over the high mind. Alex, I think one of the ways that we can um, approach this 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 aware style of show is that I've repeated this so many times. It's really driving home into my essence. This is not about Alan. This is not about Ron. This is not about simulation. This is about whatever is channeling through us that is inspiring other people to get more involved yeah, in yeah. building the future. Yeah. So one thing yeah. is that, um, yeah, involved in the that, that's important. And, I, and this is something that is really important. And this is also a very, very buzzwordy scene, building the future. It's yeah. everyone talks about, about this or this value. Yeah. And so I think there's a delicate balance because I, I do think that um, one shouldn't overuse that. But I also think that um, there is a, also a benefit of spreading that meme over and over again. Because when people say, why are they so obsessed with building the future? Why do they always talk about that? And then all of a and sudden not doing. it becomes, yeah, well, well, some people comment in and yeah, they're like, yeah. oh, I, I, you know, I've started pursuing synthetic biology or started pursuing neurotech or whatever AI that people tell us what fields they start pursuing from around the world. But the, the general idea that if we can repeat memes through songs or through videos, right? If we can repeat memes, they can become programmed that people start caring more about talking to their families and their friends and their coworkers about building the future. Mm. And so there's like a delicate balance. Don't like overuse, don't have it be too buzzwordy, but at the same time, do push the memes that you care about spreading into the world effectively. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a big balance. So one of the things that I hope we do is that um, over time, uh, with like you just said, that if the show continues to develop its in a very self-aware style, that one of the um, and doesn't end up uh, uh, d uh, diverting um, it, it, it itself to uh, something that like an outside investor or things like that, which is again why we need help um, to make sure that that doesn't happen. That that we can do things like this conversation that we're having together can we can add like we've done before two more people three more people yeah, we can have yeah, three yeah. four five six people sitting around and as we develop the studio we can really make beautiful round table co conversations happening where one person's talking yeah, at a yeah, time yeah yeah i and think it's important yeah, because it's huge there's so much information that's lost and people when people do meetings in real life it's all lost after the meeting ends and it's like 
and then they have a record of uh, uh, that's why like a lot of people are averse to meetups because it's just talking and not doing. But if you if you can get, capture what the meetup was like, um, this will this will basically totally help. Um, this will just totally help um, make sure that people actually are held accountable to what they say, which doesn't happen enough. Yeah, and then it also becomes like we're fusing world views, yeah, which yeah. is really beautiful. Yeah. That it's you. It's it, at that point it would be like you would get a message, and maybe like three or four or five of our other friends would get messages, and it would say uh, it would it would give people an option. Hey, like, what do you guys think about coming in August tenth um, from noon to two p.m. And if people say yes to be able to come into those six people we requested to be on the program. We can basically start at noon in a round table, live, live streaming it with the multi-camera shoot, yeah. and we can do a world, f world view yeah, fusion. Yeah. It's like, where has your worldview been updated the last two, three months uh -huh. since we last talked? Uh -huh. And that's what we talk about around the table. Okay. Yeah. Alex, one last thing um, on the way I, I want to ask you about. The, um, I'm, I want to ask you a question about it, and then I want to see wh what your answer is about it. Um, where do you get all of your nourishment? Where do you breathe air? Where do you eat food? Where do you drink water? Where do you get those things from? Um, why are you asking me this? Where do they come from? Um, everyone breathes the same air, although I try to breathe like, I'll, I go try to go cleaner. Like with this. They come from nature, right? These things come from yeah, earth that yeah. we live on, right? We're all living in the same house. We're all living on the same planet. Or like remnants of what was formed 4.6 billion years ago. Okay, correct. So we're all, we're all living here together. We all breathe the, breathe the air of the planet. It nourishes us. The water nourishes us. The food nourishes us. You're all using these such buzzwords. Come they're, you're, you're, this is the most buzzwordy thing you're ever saying. Most unoriginal you, buzzwordy thing. Well, ever. this. Is, well, I'm. I'm. I'm I know, just, every, I know. Everything that I'm that I've been saying in that last segment actually is directly being communicated from spiritual leaders around the planet, like indigenous wisdom. Yeah, yeah. Because what indigenous leaders are saying, Alex, is that we are extremely disconnected from the earth that sustains us and nourishes yeah, us, yeah. and the interconnectedness of us with all the other organisms and ecosystems on the planet. Does that, does that resonate? Do yes, you feel? Yes, I know, I know what you're meaning. Edward, that's what, even, even Edward o. Wilson like puts it in the most scientific way possible, even though he's not super into all that other stuff. That essence of our disconnection from what yeah, sustains yeah. us as, as, as much as we want to just say, ah, oh, that's like buzzwordy and stuff, but as much, really, that is probably the most pressing issue of our time. The global coordination problem is a direct reflection yeah. of our inability to understand where we all come from yeah. and what sustains us. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Because that's one of the memes that I think needs to get pushed forward in our world to fix the global coordination problem is when you breathe the air, when you eat the food, when you drink the water, when you take the shower, when you exercise, when you connect to the sun, when you do things like that, it is so much more spiritually connecting to source, to where we all come from, to our interconnectedness, than when we're just trapped in some of the newsfeed algorithms that just keep us there for financial, their own personal financial mm -hmm. benefits, mm -hmm. their own self-dealing mm -hmm. benefits. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Okay. Yeah. You seem you you seem like you're a, you're more um, super hyper scientifically edge of knowledge driven and uh, maybe less so uh, focused on the indigenous wisdom side of things. Mm -hmm. Is that would you say that's yeah that's yeah. right yeah? I think Alex, I think it would also be helpful um, to 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 ca capture a little bit of the essence of that indigenous wisdom as you go forth at the at the edge. I think that would help a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that may be some feedback from me from me uh -huh. to you. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah, the least. Yeah. So, okay. so yeah. All right. Good. Okay, that was fun. Fourth conversation with you, Alex. Good stuff. All right. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate. We'd love okay. to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Also, talk to more people, your friends, family, coworkers, people online on social media about the things that we discussed about aging, super connecting, about interviewing. Give us your thoughts as about me and Ron as we keep developing out this show. And hold on a second, let me just close okay. the show. Let me just close the show. And 
and also check out the links in the bio below to support us, help us grow, help us prosper, help us do the things that we talked about in this episode, like making knowledge graphs, like doing cool things, like making transcripts and highlight reels, all that cool stuff. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Thanks.